Todd Nielsen was one of the very first people I met at Microsoft. He was on the team that welcomed Fox Software into the company as we joined in July of 1992. Part of the marketing group, it was his job to ensure that we and our product were smoothly melded into the Microsoft fold. His warm, light-hearted demeanor calmed the nerves of our entire team as we moved across the country and into the arms of the seemingly enormous company. He became an early and extremely helpful friend and ally to me and the whole Fox team. Since that time, Todd has had a wide range of experiences. He left Microsoft not long after I did to work at a startup. What followed was a range of ever-increasing roles of executive responsibility, including leading several companies. He was the CEO of Borland at a very difficult time. He was co-president of VMware during a period of challenging growth. He was responsible for Heroku as it melded with the Salesforce behemoth. Today, Todd is the CEO of Financial Force, a strong player in the ERP space, part of the Salesforce universe. It's a big job in a competitive space, but perhaps nothing tells you more about Todd than his most recent connection he made for me. I ask everyone I know for referrals to engaging guests for this podcast. When I asked Todd, he immediately mentioned Michael Kennedy, the CFO of the Muscular Dystrophy Association. You heard from Mike a few episodes ago. What's interesting is that they met because the MDA is a customer of Financial Force. Todd so frequently checks in with his customers, even on the other side of the country, that he and Mike became close friends. That kind of attention to detail and passion for customers from a CEO says as much about Todd as I ever can. Todd's diverse experience in building and leading teams has made him a star in his own right, and someone I looked forward to talking with since I started this podcast. In our conversation, we talk about his journey and leading in complex times like the current pandemic. And that's what this is all about. This is Leading Smart, the show about managing in the brain power age. It's a field guide to the joys and challenges of leading and working in the modern workplace. I'm Chris Williams, your guide to the stories and ideas that I hope will inspire you to be a better leader in the world of knowledge work. This episode is another of my conversations with leaders, this time with a talented leader and multi-time CEO. This is episode 219, my conversation with Todd Nielsen. Todd Nielsen grew up not far from Redmond, Washington, the home of Microsoft. He had started his own software business building database applications for local companies when a friend of his from Microsoft came calling. So it just so happened that one of my um, high school classmates uh, got a job right out of high school, right out of college at Microsoft as a recruiter. Uh, and he was Kerry Drzdowski. And so Kerry called me and said, hey, would you, uh, you know, you're the kind of person we're looking to hire Microsoft. And at the time I, I was, you know, in the tech world, I had my own D-base consulting business and the like, but um, I was, you know, overwhelmed by Microsoft. I was like, wow, Microsoft is a big company. I mean, there's 800 employees there. Can you imagine how big that is? And, uh, you know, what I really fit in. And so um, she, uh, said, hey, come to an interview, see what happens. And uh, I, I, you know, interviewed and um, was just honored to have the opportunity to join Microsoft. And when was that? 1988. And so what did you start working on? 
So I started working on um, what became Microsoft Access. Um, and so, in fact, a, a funny story, when I first started at Microsoft, I was, you know, a young kid and I was intimidated as all get out. And my first interview was eight in the morning with Rob Glazer. <laughs> and, uh, and so, you know, Rob starts off and he, he says, um, you know, I'd like you to um, uh, write some code on the, on the whiteboard and then uh, explain to me the difference of doing it in C versus doing it in Pascal and, you know, how things are going to push on the stack or whatever. And I, of course, have no idea what he's talking about. Zero idea what he's talking about. And so uh, the question, I, I answered the question with the following answer. And this is why I'm here today and why I have a career. Because I, I looked at him and I said, you know, if my resume implies to you that I can answer that question, it goes to show that I am the greatest marketer on the planet. <laughs> there are ten. There are ten thousand people that want to be in this seat right now, and I'm here to be at Microsoft because I can know how to market. I don't know how to write the code, but I know how to talk about it and sell its value proposition and get people excited about it. Rob Glazer, who later went on to found Real Networks, the OG streaming audio service, referred Todd to the database groups, where he worked on the product later to be called Access and wound up working for Adam Bosworth, another famous name in tech. So in that journey, um, one of the things Adam said is, okay, Todd, we don't really have need for a product marketer right now. And so, uh, but because you know the database market and your enthusiasm, I want you to switch into program management, which is a more you know, technical position. And you're probably not going to be the greatest at program management, but it'll be a good experience to grow in your career and what have you. And then when the product is ready to ship, um, we can then move you back into product marketing. And so uh, we, we did that. And, um, you know, program management was a very challenging, you know, discipline for me. But I learned a, a ton. I mean, it helped me a, a bunch. Do you remember when you started to manage people? Do you remember when that happened? Sure. So when I moved into, um, when I moved over to, uh, for out of program management into product marketing for uh, Access at the time, um, I became a group product manager. And so one of my first um, hires was David Risher uh, and had, had a team of, of marketers um, working for me and, uh, you know, had just, you know, great people and was just learning what it is to lead and to manage. And, you know, in, in those days, I was a, a domain expert on the particular product and it helped to build it. And so it helped, um, me earn the respect of my, you know, employees because they could say, Hey, this guy really knows what's going on. And what he doesn't know, he's willing to admit, but he also knows other people that can find out the answer, you know, what he doesn't know. Then the next step is managing managers. Do you remember when that first happened for you? Yeah, well, that's, that first happened um, when I left uh, the, the database group at Microsoft. I ran for a period of time, the, um, what was, we call uh, the connectivity business unit which um, was a, a nice way of saying it was a substrate of the exchange group or the outlet group based in Canada. And so I was a general manager up there running that team of development, testing, you know, um, the, the core infrastructure that it takes to run the team. And, you know, they, all the leads had um, uh, employees and it was, uh, it was a new experience for me. And the other thing that was a new experience is because it was in Canada, um, in Vancouver, which is only, you know, 120 miles away from Redmond. Um, I had no idea growing up in the Northwest that there was such a, you know, cultural uh, divide and a difference between being a Canadian versus being, you know, an American. And uh, when we made the decision to uh, move the uh, business unit to Redmond and, and move people out of Vancouver, it was incredible to me how difficult it was because it was only 120 miles of, of distance. And yet people were asking me questions like, you know, am I going to need to buy a gun? Um, you know, what kind of, and just the, the whole perception of America as this different, you know, place. And so getting uh, people through uh, was very challenging. And so one of the things that I did 
is I knew that it was key to get a couple of the, the leaders to say they would move and then we could get everybody else to fall. Because we, we announced it, we, had, we gave people 30 days to let us know were they going to make the move or not. And, you know, 28 days into it, nobody, would, um, nobody was committed. And so it was like, oh, what am I going to do? So I um, took, uh, I got a meeting with a couple of the key leaders and uh, had a briefcase of cash and had a chess timer and went to him and said, you know, you have um, five minutes to decide, are you going or not? And hit the chest timer. And the person was like, well, I got to have to my wife. I got to have my family. What am I going to do? It's like, this cash is yours. If you can say, if you say yes. And so used a little bit of extra hardcore incentive to get the first couple of folks to, to make the, the leap. And then from that point, it just sort of, um, you know, snowballed into getting you know, most of the team to move down to Redmond. I remember you having to, um, going back and forth to Vancouver every other minute. Yes. That, well, that's why we eventually decided to move. Cause I, I moved, I relocated to, to Vancouver thinking I could live up there and make that happen. And then, uh, you know, in those days, conference calls and video conferences were not common. And so, in fact, I can probably recall in my whole tenure at Microsoft, I maybe was on, 10 conference calls. I mean, it was, it was, it was a very in faith in person. That's where things happen. And so I would end up driving back and forth to Vancouver, you know, probably weekly. And finally I just said, okay, this is, you know, we don't understand how to do this remote development stuff at this time. Todd rose to become a vice president, but left to join a startup called Crossgain just after the peak of the dot-com era. You know, with the dot com um, bubble, you know, we had friends and and associates that were you know billionaires on paper, and uh, I didn't think many of them were that much smarter than I was, and so I thought, well, hey, there's opportunity out there, let's figure it out. But June of 2000 was not the time to do a startup, uh, for sure, and so um, I left, and. Um, uh, we had a you know challenging year because the dot com bubble burst in March of 2000, and uh, the company was acquired um, by BEA Systems in the summer of 2001. Yes, I was the CEO of, of Crossgain uh, when I, the startup, and then uh, when BEA bought Crossgain, I uh, was their chief marketing officer. And in my last three or four months there, I was running marketing and running development, which is sort of a weird combination. Um, but my, my belief in, in leadership in general is transparency and shooting straight with people and tell them here's the good and here's the bad. And I had built up a, a solid trust from the engineering team. So they sort of said, look, if we're gonna be led by anybody, since we don't have a leader at the moment, we, we want to be taught. One of the things that, that we saw a lot of, particularly around that time, was people leaving the company, leaving Microsoft, saying to themselves, well, I've run a billion-dollar business, so I can do this, and I can be a CEO. But in point of fact, none of those people had had sales working for them. None of those people had had support working for them. None of those people even knew how to pay rent. None of those people knew. Yeah. So... So um, an awful lot of people went out thinking, I can be a CEO. Um, you left and thought you could be a CEO. Was that a rude awakening? Was that something you understood? Or did you know what you were getting into? Uh, no, I, my first CEO gig at Cross Game was certainly an um, eye-opening experience. I mean, I, 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 was, was, I grew up at Microsoft where I was you know, coddled, if you will, or had infrastructure and had everything in place. And, you know, at, uh, at Crossgang, our first office was, you know, in, in Bellevue and was, you know, this funky little space. And, and, you know, I was just like, wait, wait a second, where, where am I? And so it took a while to, you know, get comfortable. And because of just the, the economy and what was happening with the dot-com bubble, it just, um, you know, became a challenge. It's the multiple roles thing that I think people don't get out of the CEO. They don't understand. I mean, the the fact that that you're the one person, you know, I, the, it's 
this buck stops here thing is overplayed, but it's really, in fact, quite true. Yeah, yeah it, it is true. The, the advantage I had in my first one was at CrossGame, um, my kind of partner at Microsoft, Adam Bosworth, uh, was there as well, and he was a founder. And so, and in those days, and we were only 25 people when I joined, and so that uh, was mostly development and program management. So it wasn't, say, uh, it wasn't a big organization. And I had Adam to, to work with on the, the technology side and what have you. Um, and so um, it was, if you will, a, a relatively um, easy transition because it was more like just running a product group. You had to deal with things like, you know, finance and GNA and real estate and stuff like that, which I didn't have to deal with at Microsoft, but um, I could be more experienced with that or more comfortable with that than if it was, you know, enterprise sales or what have you at the time. Crossgain was sold to BEA Systems and Todd followed, but he left before too long. Then he got a call from an old friend, Greg Maffei, the one-time CFO of Microsoft. And then Greg Maffei called me up and said, hey, I'm going to take the job as one of the co-presidents of Oracle, and it's likely Larry's going to be leaving, you know, at some point, and I'll be an heir apparent because I'm a real software guy, and I need a right-hand person, and you'd be great. And so Greg kind of gave me the comfort to say, okay, I'll make this move. And so for three months, um, Greg and I were at, at Oracle. And then that was my premise of joining Oracle. And then three months later, or um, Greg leaves. And so now I'm just like, whoa, what am I, what am I doing here? Your parachute and, is gone. <laughs> yeah, what, what, what's, what's happened? And, you know, uh, Charles Phillips um, was a great guy, is a great guy, uh, was, was a great leader and, and, and mentor. But I just, um, you know, without the, the comfort with Greg, I was just not comfortable that there was a future for me at Oracle. And then at the same time, uh, I got a, a phone call from a recruiter about the CEO opportunity at Borland. And Borland in those days, um, it was a public company and I didn't have my public company CEO stripes. And so I figured if I could get that job, that would be a great opportunity for me to, to, um, to take, even though Borland's heyday was more the mid eighties to, you know, the mid nineties. And then, you know, when Philippe left in 95, it sort of went on a wandering soul in the, in the desert, uh, trying to figure out, you know, what they were going to do. And, um, for me to join, it became the opportunity of, it's kind of a no lose situation because I can be bold. I can make acquisitions. I can do things. And, if, I, if I'm not successful, I can say, hey, I tried everything and the patient was just so sick. I'm sorry that it's, it's gone. And if I turn it around, I could be a hero. So um, it gave me a chance to sort of be confident enough to, to you know, be bold and work with the team and, and figure out what's, what the right direction is. So was it your um, legendary marketing prowess that talked yourself into that CEO job? As you said, you didn't have your CEO stripes. How did you get that job? Yeah, um, yeah, well, one, uh, I, I don't know who the other c candidates were, but clearly I knew a lot about Borland because they were my primary competitor And so, when I was at Microsoft. And so when it came to saying, okay, who can we have as a leader? I had clearly leadership capabilities and I knew everything about Borland um, from the, the history books. In fact, a funny story, when I joined, um, I was telling some story about Borland in the early 90s. And one of the employees raised uh, her hand and said, what enablement session did you go to to learn all of this? You know, I've been here for eight years and I didn't get all of this. I'm learning stories from you about Borland. And it's like, well, I saw it from another side of the of, of the fence. So. So when you were at Borland, so here you are, you walk in, um, as you said, the patient was, you know, uh, open on the operating table. Um, that's a leadership challenge aside from you having to learn the CEO chop side of it, but that's a leadership challenge. So what is, um, what is your thinking on, as you walk in the door, what are you thinking about how to get this team, um, you know, off the operating table? Yeah, the, the team was, was, um, 
really just needing a vision or a direction. And based on the pieces we had, I put together uh, working with, you know, the, the marketing person uh, and the head of products, a, a direction on, hey, we're going to focus and, and really double down on uh, what we call time the application lifecycle management space. I made the decision to spin out the tools business and we sold it to um, uh, another uh, organization that acquired the, the, the people and the, um, the IP. And then we would focus on application lifecycle management. Eventually, Todd turned the company around enough to find a buyer. He was working on closing that deal when another old friend from Microsoft, Paul Moritz, came calling. I, too, had worked with Paul at Microsoft, not only as a manager, but later as his HR director. So the, the acquisition of Borland, we started the discussions kind of in the summer, fall, if you will, of 2008. And um, the deal wasn't quite signed, but my uh, friend and mentor, Paul Moritz, in July, uh, became the CEO of VMware. Um, I met with Paul and, uh, you know, when he became CEO to congratulate him. And he, uh, he said, okay, I haven't really been, I was at Microsoft with you. I've been on an eight-year philanthropy and joy life journey. You know, tell me what the CEO has to worry about. And so I was running him through all the different things that the CEO worries about. And Paul was like, okay, I hate all of those things. Uh, I like, you know, product strategy and direction, but I don't want to do with that other stuff. So will you um, come join me and be um, a chief operating officer at, at VMware? And that had to be fun because Paul's fun to work with. Yeah, Paul's, incre Paul's incredible. It, 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 was a, it was an incredible experience. I learned a ton. Um, the other thing I, I learned that was interesting at, at VMware is this was after the financial crisis. So at the beginning of 2009, um, you know, the world, uh, you know, VMware stock, when they went public in the spring of 2008, it went up to like 117 or 120 or something like that. And then, you know, six months later or something like that, um, it was down to 15 or 16. And so it just, and in the Valley, when your company stock, stock goes up and then goes down, rarely does it go back up again. And so getting employees to believe that, hey, this is a valuable thing and, and we've got real asset here uh, took a bit of time to, um, to, for, for people to believe that you know, the changes we were making was, uh, you know, were important. Right. But they ended up doing okay, right? I oh, mean, no, like they, 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 we, 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 did, we had a great, we had a great run. When I, when I joined uh, at the beginning of 2009, they finished 2008 in about doing about uh, 1.8 billion in revenue. And when I left in 2013, they were doing um, over six in revenue and the market cap went from, you know, 8 billion to 50 billion. So it was, um, it was a great uh, experience. The ride at VMware offered many chances to learn about leading in both bad times and good. It exposed Todd to a small company called Heroku, who was at the forefront of development for the cloud. Once again, a phone call from a leader got Todd his next gig. And then in 2010, uh, Salesforce bought Heroku and announced it at, um, at their big conference, Dreamforce. And so when I left VMware, um, Mark uh, Benioff um, uh, and, and team gave me a call and said, uh, look, it's your manifest destiny to run Heroku. Um, and you know about this, so why don't you come join, uh, you know, the team and, and, and lead this effort. And, uh, at that time, they, you know, Heroku had been at Salesforce for a couple of years and they were, you know, there were two cultures there. There was the Salesforce culture, um, which very is very old school, old school enterprise, customer centric, let's go. And there's the complete new school with the cool kids. I mean, the average age of the Heroku team was, you know, 27 and they were, you know, very um, hip and on top of things and the, the cultures just clashed. And so I spent my first six months um, trying to build bridges between the Heroku team and the Salesforce team because the Salesforce team had, you know, had basically said, you arrogant kids at Heroku, we're, we're writing you off. And so I think every presentation I did for the first six months, I said, I'm sorry. 
you know, <laughs> let, 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 give me a clean start. Let me put an olive branch out. Let me do something to kind of build this. But what was, inter- what was interesting is it took me a while to earn the trust of the Heroku team and the millennials because they were first concerned, is this guy just some Salesforce corporate schmuck that's going to, you know, try to, to ruin us? And, you know, I spent a lot of time with each of the employees. I had a one-on-one with every employee in my first hundred days to really understand where they were. And this was my first time managing millennials. And it's a different world. I mean, they would tell me things like, hey, Todd, I lead a purpose-driven life. And, you know, I'll give you 40 hours a week and maybe 41, but I got to know what's the broader, bigger purpose. So I'm, you know, making an impact, which is great. But in my day, you know, in the 80s at Microsoft, you know, we would sleep under our desk. um, And there was no, the purpose-driven life was, my purpose is, the company. And that's what the focus is. So it was a different kind of spin as far as uh, getting them excited about customer impact and how it goes and, and, and how to, how to really um, influence the world as well as providing them opportunities to do, you know, social um, um, philanthropy and stuff like that. So it, it was, it was, I learned a ton about how organizations can't just be old school. What I say goes, make it happen because, you know, smart people, they, they have a lot of choices and, you know, no one would say this to me directly, but basically it would be like, look, if you don't give me what I want, I'm going to go to the startup next door and they will. Um, and so it was a bit of the, how do I get people excited about what's um, what's happening um, without, you know, losing or whatever. You know, vision has always been sort of the underlying thing. I don't know many people who were sleeping under their desk at Microsoft because they thought they'd become a billionaire. I think they were sleeping under their desk because they thought they were going to change the world. For sure. For, I, I absolutely agree with that, for sure. And it's just the, the mindset has changed now where they, um, they wanted to see the impact to make it happen, but they also had other aspects of their life. They wanted, right. they cared about, Salesforce had, has a... Um, uh, philosophy that they call their one, 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 where every employee, where they give uh, 1% of their employees time, 1% of their equity, 1% of their revenue to um, charitable organizations. And it's really been a powerful way to get, you know, the employee population at Salesforce um, activated and impacting the the world in ways beyond just software. Yeah. I think that's one of the interesting things about the CEO role um, in that I think one of the things that most people don't see who, who look up at a CEO is they don't realize that in many ways the CEO is the, like when you were talking about the relationship of Heroku and, and, and Salesforce, I was thinking of the, it was it Damon Wayans who did the, the Obama anger translator, you know, I, (laughs) so I, um, I'm thinking of the CEO, though, is the interface to the outside world, whether that outside world is the parent company or the outside world. And and where do you think the balance for a CEO, does it change? Is it pretty constant? Um, is a CEO always um, 50-50, inner focused, outer focused? Is it, what's that balance? That's That's a great question. I think it partly depends on, where the on the specific CEO and what his comfort zone is. I think uh, a good balance is certainly 50 50 because if you err too much to just external, you, you can end up being disconnected or out of sync with your, your team or your employee base. And so I like to kind of be um, realistic and pragmatic and connected to my team as well as paint a vision and a story to the future. One of the things that I find is a lot of, you know, leaders in the world today, um, they may have a vision, but it's nowhere at all connected to reality. And so their employee population or, you know, people that know the company well will look at it and say, there's a huge disconnect between A and B, you know, what planet are you on? And I really try to um, be realistic and, you know, honestly assess, hey, here's where we're great and here's where we're not. You know, another just, you know, technique I use is um, I encourage my employees to 
um, try new things, to innovate, to, to go. And if they're going to fail, that's fine. Just course correct quickly. I, um, a lot of CEOs play the, I'm going to throw my phone and I'm going to scream and yell if you got something wrong. And I believe that, hey, if you get something wrong, that's okay as long as you learn from it and you're able to course correct quickly and, and move it to the right, you know, to the next path. The role Todd had as the leader of Heroku inside Salesforce was called a CEO, but in some ways, that's a misnomer. It was a little bit funky in that they would call it, I think the titles they have today is they call them CEOs of those particular units. I see. But it's a little bit of a funky world um, because uh, at Salesforce, um, you know, products leaders um, really don't own as much as a CEO does in an in, in organization because Salesforce is a very um, matrix organization. So development, you know, sales, product management, program management, they all report into their functions. And then the cross-functional kind of overlay are these product leaders. And so at Salesforce, I had to learn how to be successful and a motivator because if I wanted to do something with the product, but the dev team who reported to somebody else said, no, no, we're going to go this way because our manager was saying that there's a conflict and I would generally lose. And so it was a matter of okay, how can I rationalize and, and work through that? And um, to, to be honest, I, I struggled in that organization because I didn't, I was doing so much via influence and relationship versus being able to say, hey, this is the direction, let's go. Right. But, um, I eventually ended up leaving Salesforce. Got it. Um, but you didn't leave the universe. So you wander in the wilderness a little and someone comes yeah. along and says, here's this financial force thing. Is that how that happened? Uh, yeah. Uh, the, the one thing I did uh, that I've learned is, you know, I'm not a startup person. So I'm not a three people and a dog kind of leader. I, I So I had this this mandate of, I'm going to go to a company that uh, is at least $50 million in revenue. And the reason I picked that 50 million is because at 50 million or above, um, you generally have a product direction, you have some customers and you just need to figure out how to scale and how to do processes. And that's what I, I'm good at. Um, what surprised me is when I left Salesforce, I was fortunate that there was a number of press articles that said, you know, Todd's leaving Salesforce. And so I had a lot of inbound calls and in the Bay Area, um, I was getting, you know, five or six calls a week, but maybe one a month was more than $50 million in revenue. Uh, they were all little small companies. Oh, this would be great. Come, you know, come here. And it was just like, no, no, I don't want to do that. And so uh, finally, a friend of mine, uh, Mike Rosenbaum said, uh, hey, I'm on the board of Financial Force. You need to come to this company. They're in the ecosystem. You know them. And, you know, you'd be great. And, you know, Mike really helped convince me to, to take this role. And so that was what, three years or so ago? 2017, I started in beginning 2017. So what are the, what's the vision? What are the challenging things that you're trying to get done at Financial Force? Yeah, that's, you know, that's a great question. One of the things I looked at, because uh, this is my first you know, journey into applications per se. Um, I've been a you know, system software developer kind of person my entire career. And so this was the first role where I didn't, I didn't have the domain expertise where you, know, you could put me in a dark room with system software problems and I can navigate my way through it and I understand the you know, ins and outs. But in you know, ERP software, I'm you know, a fish out of water. Um, and so that was um, a challenge. But I knew that um, before I joined, uh, Oracle was acquiring our primary competitor, NetSuite. And since I knew that um, Oracle doesn't necessarily have a love relationship with many of their customers, I thought, hey, there's probably an opportunity here for, for us to figure this out. And so, um, you know, started the journey to really meet with the employees and customers and get the right leaders in place that could kind of scale and, and you know, evolve the company where the direction is. And the, the good thing about um, Financial Force is, you know, when I joined in 2017, I'd spent, you know, the previous 10 years really being an early adopter and driver in the cloud. 
And the most of the application world were still concerned that the cloud is, you know, crazy. I don't want to be part of this. You know, what's going to happen with hackers and what have you? And things were pivoting such that the world was beginning to see that, you know what, unless I'm going to spend millions of dollars securing my own data center every year, I'm better off just going to the cloud. And to not be in the cloud is kind of like putting my money under my mattress. Right. So uh, Financial Force has, has this great opportunity where there's, you know, everybody, every company needs a financial system. And, you know, it's, uh, the legacy is on-premise systems, be it from Great Plains or Solomon or, you know, what have you. And so there's a great opportunity to, you know, move those folks over to the cloud. And, you know, now I meet with, you know, multiple CIOs that will say they're building a cloud-only infrastructure. And if you would have told me that 10 years ago, I would have said, you know, maybe 20 years out, but there's no way uh, people are going to have a cloud-only infrastructure in, you know, 2020. So here comes Todd Nielsen, Todd walking in the door, been doing tools and system software for decades and walks into this meeting full of people who are application software people. And um, how do you win? How do you win their trust, particularly when you can't speak their language? Yeah, so I, I, I couldn't speak the direct language. But I, I, I was exposed enough because I worked with many companies in my career that were building, you know, accounting systems on top of system software that we had had. So I knew enough about requirements as far as, you know, performance and scale and things like that. So I, I could be credible. And given I came from Salesforce and the financial force is built 100% on Salesforce, um, that gave me some additional, you know, credibility I was able to leverage. Did did you spend what six months trying to to or was it fairly easy to get people to listen to you? Um, it 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 took some time. I mean, of course, you know people are going to listen to the CEO and offer respect, but to earn that trust uh, t- took it took a little time. So what I did in the case of um, uh, Financial Force, uh, it turns out that we've got about two hundred or so employees in this little town in the uh, UK in Yorkshire in a little town called Harrogate. We're headquartered in the US, but a majority of the development all happens in, in Harrogate. And so my first year there, uh, I, I went and spent three months in the fall where I moved, my wife and I basically relocated to Harrogate to spend time with the people. And um, that immersion, if you will, into their culture and appreciation. And, and to be honest, my wife, Allison, um, she would, moved to Harrogate. Uh, she's like, this is, you know, I, I love this place. It's, 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 you know, they've embraced her and she's embraced them. And so that really went a long way for folks to say, gosh, this person cares about the company and cares about us because he's willing to uproot his own life to, um, you know, spend time with us. We then change topic to the latest challenge facing all leaders these days, the pandemic. Todd and Financial Force are already used to working remotely, being based in the U.S. with development teams in the U.K. and the Seattle area. How does he see the pandemic facing them? So you're, the company's already remote, um, or at least in some dimensions. Um, how do you see it, this whole thing shaken out with work from home? Yeah. Um, you know, uh, some of my employees refer to it as we don't work from home. We live at work. <laughs> yeah. Um, and, uh, you know, it, it's, it's obviously been a shock to the system at first, but, um, I think as time has gone on, we've gotten, um, uh, used to it. And what's made it possible is one, it's not something, this isn't Todd's experiment where I'm saying, okay, this company is going to work from home and the rest of the world is, is you know, it's, its own course. This is affecting everybody globally, you know, customers and everything. And so because everybody's in it together, it's sort of forced everyone to say, okay, let's figure out how to make this work. Um, I know, you know, my belief before this happened was SaaS software in order to sell SaaS software for any company, you know, any value more than, you know, $10,000, you have to meet in person. 
and you know shake the hands and 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 do that and i think we've all learned my head of um my chief revenue officer says hey look we're all in inside sales now and so we all gotta you know figure this out and uh and so it's been interesting leading an organization through this because one of the things that you know leaders are are good at is knowing a direction and saying this is what's going to happen and then leading through the milestones of how it happens well the crazy thing is you know in our world um you know when this COVID thing happened we didn't know what the, what next week was going to be like you know we we shut our offices down march 12th and i literally thought we were going to be back in the office april 10th and so um you know one of the lines i came up with is that last week's worst case scenario is this week's plan of record and so there's you know for the first three months it was just like oh my gosh what's going on and you know to, to ease my employees um i i started holding these uh, all hands meetings every two weeks and was very transparent with them on what we knew and what we didn't know and that sort of gave them a sense of comfort and gave them a sense of okay this is yeah you know, he's not taking us on the on a journey blindly but we're you know we're on this with them and then you know i've seen some really exciting things where my my leaders have done things like you know they have virtual happy hours uh you know one team had um bring work to kids day and so they would have you know a little thing with, with the kids and just trying to really uh understand and embrace and appreciate the complexities people have from working from home with families and kids and and all the, the challenges there and trying to be flexible so that that can um it'll be successful it's it will be interesting to see what happens in a um I mean, the, the, the building software from home thing, I think a lot of people can sort of figure out how that'll work and that might work. The, the, the whole sales and marketing side of the world, boy, that, that gets thrown a pretty serious loop here. Um, as you noted, I mean, enterprise software or enterprise sales of any kind have always been around a conference room table. Yeah, absolutely. But now I think people are, are used to, I mean, five months into this, I think they're used to the Zoom interface. What I find is if we've met in person before, you can easily get things moving. If we haven't met in person at all and you're establishing a first connection, then it's a little bit more challenging. But, you know, it's, it's um, if you think about, you know, what it's going to take to get back into an office and then be comfortable that you're going to have customers in or vendors in to see you. And what, what's the safety? And there's a whole bunch of logistics to figure that stuff out. And so I think many companies, or just at least in the tech sector, are saying, we're just going to work from home for the rest of this year and we'll see what happens and, and make the best of it. You know, what's funny is I, I was on a panel with a bunch of uh, CEO friends of mine, and um, we were asked a question about productivity. And all of us have different ways to measure KPIs and productivity, but every one of us said that our productivity of our development teams has actually improved. Um, and I think you know part of it comes to uh, generally um, developers are more introverted, and as such, not being in an office where they're distracted or bugged by other people gives them a chance to just focus and and work on you know the challenges in front of. You know, one other funny story about on the sales side is one of the things we're finding now is customers that have historically been challenging to meet with in person because of their schedules or what have you are now easier to meet with and so um you know one of the things i've had to look at in our sales cycles is the fact that they're meeting with you know person x and having an engaging you know hour-long conversation they're they're in my opinion um inappropriately moving something further along in the sales cycle saying, look, you know, in the old world, this would be a stage four. And I'm like, yeah, but in this new world, yes, you had an engaging conversation, but it's still stage two. Um, you know, it's, it's going to take, there's more steps we have to go through in order to, to get to the, you know, the final deal close. Advantage now of, you know, our system plus Salesforce is you get this full 360 degree view of front office and back office being together. And so being able to, you know, double click on an invoice all the way through to the beginning opportunity and see that thread really provides, 
you know, insight and visibility into your customers that you, know, you probably haven't had before. And so there's some real benefits to the vision that, that Mark is on. And, you know, Mark is, um, he, he often says these statements, like, you know, connect to your customers in a whole new way. And sometimes people think, oh, that's just, you know, marketing. But when you actually drill into it, you realize, gosh, there's some real substance and some real innovation in, um, you know, in, the, in that vision. Todd Nielsen became an effective leader and CEO by facing an interesting array of challenges. Throughout it all, he demonstrated thoughtful leadership and a big heart. I'd like to thank him for his time and for sharing his experience with us. Leading Smart is from me, Chris Williams. You can find out more about the show and discover other resources for leaders at my website, clwill.com. If you like the show, please share it with your friends, especially on social media. Referrals are the greatest source of new listeners. I'd also love your feedback. I'm the CL Will on Twitter, LinkedIn, and Facebook. Or send an email to pod at clwill.com. That's it for this episode. The next episode will continue the series on communication. I hope you'll listen. Until then, please remember that each of the several dozen decisions you make today are part of Leading Smart. <music>